I had these confusing feelings for a guy. It's really not the story that people expect. People like categories. <laughs> they do. They do. I would say 99% of my life, though, has been pretty gay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. We're breaking things down a little bit differently today. It's Ryan Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. We are on vacation, as it were, but these episodes might occur out of order. So please don't be like, oh, I'm so glad you got a vacation because by the time you see this, I will not be on vacation anymore. I'd like to welcome my favorite vacation buddy, Jonathan Cohen. What? Look at that entrance, everyone. Hi, we're, Ryan. Hi. How are you doing? We're sitting so close to each we're other. We're sitting so close. Now you know we're not one person that we like edit in. We're two different no people. When I was a kid, we had uh, these two veterinarians. They were brothers. And my parents would always have this like elaborate joke that like they think it's one person, but it's like it went on. They'd be like, he goes in the other room, he combs his hair, he pretends to be the other one. Anyway. And you believe I No, but it was like a running a joke, joke in the family that like, oh, which Dr. Brown did you see? <laughs> anyway, we're here um, doing some episodes from vacation and we have a very, very, very fancy person. Um, we're going to be talking to Tig Notaro. If you don't know who Tig Notaro is, you ought to know who um, she is. She's a multi Emmy and Grammy nominated stand-up comic. Um, you may know her from Colbert or Jimmy Fallon or Ellen. Um, Ellen actually produced her second HBO special, um, which just came out um, a couple months ago, which is called Tig Notaro Drawn. It is the first fully animated hour of stand-up comedy ever. It is awesome. And Girlish Boy Interrupted is her first HBO special. What a lot of people know Tig Notaro for um, is that she was diagnosed with cancer in 2012. Um, and she addressed her diagnosis live on stage, which is a very big deal. Um, and she ended up having a double mastectomy, chose not to have reconstructive surgery, and also chose to appear topless, as it were, um, which really normalized for a lot of, of women in particular, um, the breast cancer experience. And she's just, she's really incredible. Um, she also happens to be a vegan, which I'm very excited about. Uh, she's also participated in Better Together, a mental health storytelling summit, which is really cool. Um, she has two podcasts. She has two podcasts, um, and she'll talk about those. Do we have anything we want to talk about before we welcome Tig? I don't think so. She's, you know what, we should say this. She was kicked out of three different schools. It's true. She never graduated high school. And she talks a lot about that. She's a really, really interesting person. And we're very, very um, thrilled to have her with us. So without further ado, Tig Natara. Break it down. We're really excited to talk to you about many, many things. Um, I first of all want to say, um, Drawn is really, really phenomenal. And just as, as a, it's just a completely personal question and forgive me, I'm kind of out of pop culture. I don't know if you've answered this a million times. Whose idea was this to do this this way? I actually sold the project the day that Hollywood shut down, um, thinking we were just going to return back to life in a couple of weeks. But um, I had had different jokes and stories of mine animated over the years on TV shows or websites. And I enjoyed that. And, um, and I had worked with the director. I didn't work with him. Uh, I had spoken to the director who ended up directing Drawn, um, trying to get him to um, animate uh, a story of mine like over a decade ago. And there was no studio or network behind me, so I would have had to shell out thousands and thousands of dollars just to, like, get a three-minute story animated. So I was just like, I don't know if I'm willing to do that. And then I went my – we went our separate ways, and then I just thought – I have all this uh, material that I thought I'd put into an album that wasn't, like, my most recent material, but it was still material I would – 
put in and out of shows that I liked. And then I just thought, what if I just animated start to finish um, the special? It's pretty awesome. And I think also what's so special about it, and obviously I'm not the only person to think that it's special, um, but it would be so easy for so many things not to work, but it really, it is done as if it's not animated. I don't know how else to describe it. And I, I mean, it's, every reaction, every time you need to see what's happening in the audience and want to feel like you're there, it's like, there's not a missed moment. Well, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. You're known for, for many things. And, you know, one of the things that um, so many people talk about is how brave you've been. And I know people don't like that word, but we have a lot of brave people who come and talk to us about all, all sorts of aspects of their life. But, um, you know, the way you have chosen to talk about cancer um, and in particular how it impacts women and how it impacts um, people's perceptions of our bodies is if you did nothing else, that would be a tremendously fantastic, wonderful achievement. <laughs> um, you've done so many other incredible things, but to be quite honest, I'm really interested in um, what you were like growing up. I'm curious about anyone who grows up in the South, just because it's very, very far from anywhere that I could ever imagine my life being. Where are you from? I, I was raised in Los Angeles and my parents are from the Bronx and my grandparents are immigrants. So, you know, the South to me is like Florida was our version of the South because that's where <laughs> Jews went when they were done living in the Bronx. Um, but I'm especially curious about someone like you who obviously has so many different paths that you, you know, that you walk. What were you like as a kid? Like, what was Little Tig like? Little Tig um, was, I was very, um, I mean, I came from a funny family, and I think that I had a real connection to an awareness of comedy, and and uh, I think that I was just, it was just my natural go-to of being funny, but I was also mischievous, and... Um, my mother was too. She was very much my um, my first comedy idol, and she was very uh, she was a prankster and mischievous and funny and all of those things. And um, so I think I was very inspired by her. And she also, when I was growing up, really encouraged me to tell anybody that had a problem with me to go to hell. <laughs> and um, and so not that I really my mother actually would tell people to go to hell, whereas I I didn't tell people to go to hell. But I think it was just ingrained in me, like with how I carried myself was just kind of like, eh, you can you can go to hell. You know, you don't you don't like this. Or you don't agree with that. And so, yeah, I think I was rebellious, mischievous, funny. Um, I think I was all those things. How did your rebellion and mischievousness play out? Uh, a lot in, I guess, everywhere. I mean, in the classroom, I always failed. I failed three grades. I dropped out of high school. I The last year that I graduated was seventh grade. And so if that gives you any insight about um, <laughs> uh, my school situation, but I was in this class that was full of kids that were, I, you know. Rebellious and mischievous? At, yeah, at I guess they'd call it like at-risk kids. And, and um, so I was in one of those classes. And, and uh, I remember we were, of course, all acting up and because it was just a zoo in that classroom. And I remember the teacher was so upset with us. And she said, okay, uh, you're just going to be doing crossword puzzles. There's no talking. And just do these worksheets. And I don't want to hear a peep, not a word out of any of you. And this kid next to me said, um, once we were doing the crossword puzzles, uh, she said, well, what, are we, what are we supposed to do? And I said, oh... Um, whoever finishes first is supposed to like jump up and say, I'm finished. <laughs> and, um, and then you get an extra whatever points on the test this week. And so, uh, we're all doing our 
crossword puzzles. And then this girl next to me jumps up and yells, I'm finished. And the teacher was like, sit down and be quiet. And, you know, of course, the girl next to me was um, like, I I thought that's what, but you know. And you know, that kind of thing. So that kind of, that's mischievous, I guess, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally buying mischievous. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. You know, we all experience stress or uncertainty differently. You might not be feeling depressed, but if you feel anxious, if you feel short-tempered or irritable, if you're experiencing strain on any of your relationships, it might be a good time to unload, to start learning about therapy. BetterHelp and their team of experienced therapists has helped so many people get through the lows that they experience from time to time, or even just confusion or feeling aimless. BetterHelp's customized online therapy that has video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist you don't have to see anyone on camera if you're not comfortable doing that. It's more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your assigned therapist in under 48 hours. Unload some of those stressors. Get unbiased feedback from a licensed professional. See if it's for you. You'd be surprised what you can gain from it. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and my Bialik listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com break. Join over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That's betterhelp.com slash break. My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Ritual. Jonathan, did you know that over 97% of women age 19 to 50 are not getting enough vitamin D? That's a lot. 95% are not getting the recommended daily intake of key omega-3s. Omegas are key. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin was formulated by exhaustive research, and that's a good thing, to help fill nutrient gaps in the diets of women ages 18 and over. But Ritual didn't stop there, did they, Jonathan? What'd they do? They'd never stop there. They invested in a gold standard university-led clinical trial, those are the best, to prove the impacts of Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin. Ritual is committed to third-party testing from USP and the Non-GMO Project. They have traceable and vegan-friendly ingredients and always clear communication, no shady stuff. We love Ritual because it is one way to get everything you need in one happy little multivitamin. And then you know you're starting the day off right. Right now, Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off their first three months. Visit ritual.com slash breakdown and turn healthy habits into a ritual. That's 10% off at ritual.com slash breakdown. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. You know, my life is insane. I think that's pretty much clear. And one of the hardest things about having an insane, busy, crazy life is not filling enough of the nutritional gaps in one's diet. The thing that's amazing about Athletic Greens is that one scoop has 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. So that means it fills in the gaps in all the things that I don't get in the food that I'm trying to eat all day while I'm so busy and crazy. It's lifestyle friendly. I'm vegan, but if you're keto, if you're paleo, if you're dairy-free, gluten-free, if you're trying to avoid sugar, this is the essential everything for you. And right now, Athletic Greens has got us covered for year-round immune support by offering our audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit our link today. Go to athleticgreens.com slash breakdown, join health experts, athletes, and health-conscious go-getters like us who make a daily commitment to our health. Again, visit athleticgreens.com slash breakdown and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. You were also really, you were really into music and um, a bit of that is also in, in Drawn, um, but not that everyone who's into music is rebellious and mischievous. Yeah. But I am wondering if there was um, any sort of you know, kind of longing or freedom that you felt, you know, from the kind of music that you were into or the the kind of social structure that kind of being part of a band or part of that kind of group provided. I tried to put bands together and it was usually just me and uh, I'd be playing whatever three 
chords I knew. And then my friend, I had this friend Rita and she was a drummer. And I don't even think that we were playing the same song at the same time. It's just, I would go plug in my guitar into my amp. I'd play songs and then she'd beat on her drums. And like, we just told everybody we were in a band. But yeah, I felt like that was, I thought that was, and I, it was, I mean, that was the world that, um, that made sense to me. And all my guy friends were like, I always, in a cartoon version in my head, it was like the little kid versions of the Ramones, you know, just like bowl haircuts and denim jackets and nobody's face is, you can't like decipher who's who. It's just like, uh, but that was the world that, um, that made sense to me. And my wife was actually making fun of me this morning because I, ha do you live in Los Angeles? Yeah. You do now. Okay. Um, the, ra the radio station, 95.5 KLOS. Of course, KLOS. Yeah. Okay. The morning show has this segment where this guy comes in and he dissects songs and he takes them apart layer by layer and you so you listen to like the drums and then he puts the layer in of the bass and then he puts in the layer of the piano and the guitar and then the lead guitar and the and the harmony and um and this morning he was dissecting a Queensryche song um that was like um any my point is Stephanie was sitting there like um you know like oh don't don't change the channel. I love this uh, show. And it's like, oh, boom, 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 boom. You know, you know what I mean? Like nothing in her mind. She's like, what the hell are we listening to? And I'm like, I love th this is this is what I'm into. Like, I love hearing the song dissected. And I love that this guy that that's what he's doing is just pulling apart these songs. And and I want to be friends with him. It's funny you mention that because, you know, not to sound like I'm an expert on Tig Notaro, but um, a, a lot of a lot of kind of the comedy that you do, a lot of the way that you approach kind of at least, you know, what we get to see of your view of the world really is kind of like pulling out all those layers. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I I mean, I, I think that totally makes sense to me that that would be something that appeals to you in terms of how to listen to listen to a Queensryche song. Because um, <laughs> that is kind of the feeling, you know, that I think many people get. And I think that's, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of kinds, obviously, there's a lot of styles of different stand-up comedy, but yours is very, it is, it's very analytical, you know, um, and that it's something... Um, that I really enjoy. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I do want to mention, so there's a, you have a, a thing in, in Drawn about music where you have, um, you, you do a talent show with yeah. this girl who like, she's at a keyboard, at least the way that it's illustrated, she's a keyboard and you're, and you, you forget, um, what to do. And you, you forget basically the song and she's kind of like playing and singing. And when I was in, I was in jazz band, I was a trumpet player. I was one of the only female trumpet players in my band. And I was in, in orchestra, but also in jazz band because that's what the cool nerds did, right? Sure. And I had the very classic trumpet solo to um, In the Mood, you know, da da da, -da you know, like, yeah. Yeah. I completely forgot it. Like, and, <laughs> and I was looking at the music, meaning... The music's in front of me and I got one measure off and, you know, 12 year old me could not catch up. And so in a full concert in the middle of my junior high <laughs> jazz band performance, I just stood there. With it. Anyway, I was supposed to tell a story on um, Conan that was a true story. And it's like having the music in front of me. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I didn't have to, you knew like, it. I knew it. I lived it. I mean, to be fair, I had just um, been through, it was in 2012, I had been through all of my cancer, my mother dying, all this. And that day, when I was thinking I was coming through the end, actually, I wasn't even, I didn't even know I had cancer yet. It was, I had been, I had my intestinal disease, I had pneumonia, my mother died. Uh, and that was the day I showed up to tape Conan and my girlfriend and I broke up. 
right before my taping. <laughs> and so I was supposed to tell this story and I forgot. And I was I the audience was laughing and I said, oh, my gosh, you guys think I'm I'm joking. You think I'm doing a bit right now. And they were like still laughing. And I was like, no, I um, I, I was so like out of my head and I finally came back and and I was retracing my steps and trying to tell the story. And then afterwards in the green room, when the producer came in, he said, hey, you know, just so we, just so you know, we can um, re-edit that. And um, and I said, you know, and I think it was because I was so in a weird space in my head and life that I was just like, you know what? Can you not edit it and just <laughs> leave it like it is? And I just kind of want people to see that. And he was like, sure. Yeah, we could do that too. And so that's like out there. And some somebody wrote something about it once and in this way of like, not sure if I was kidding or if that like, so just to clarify, I was not kidding. I Hopefully really- Hopefully they listen to our podcast. We're gonna and send this clip to That's them. right, we're gonna send this as a press release. Just kidding. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, whatever kind of level that you like to about gender, sexuality. Did you always know that you were gay? Do you have a fantastic coming out story? Did you date a gaggle of men? Like, what's the story? Sure. I, I, I didn't know I was gay. I, I, um, I had what I think were, I mean, crushes on guys. I, I really was very close with guys and, to this day, I mean, a lot of my closest friends are men and and I think there were some blurred lines of how I felt of like I, I just loved these guys so much, you know, um, and but I wasn't really <laughs> a hot item in the dating circle, <laughs> um, but uh, or dating scene or whatever it was. Uh, for sure, my female friends were the more appealing options to these, to these guys. But, um, and I always wanted a child, but I never pictured myself with any sort of partner. I just pictured myself. Um, I always thought I'd be riding a bicycle and there'd be a kid in the front basket. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't really clued into that. And then I, um, I met a friend in Colorado and we were, uh, we played music together um, and we were very close and, and cracked up all the time. And, and uh, I started to develop these feelings where I was like, and this is, I was like 18 or 19. I mean, I mean, I know people see me and they're like, oh, she must've just like flown out into the world knowing what's going on, but I, I just didn't, you know? And, um, but yeah, I fell for my first girlfriend in, uh, Colorado and, and, um, and then I came out to my mother soon after. I think I went through a period where I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm gay. It's just her, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's not quite the story everybody assumes from me. And, um, in fact, even as an adult, after I fell for a woman and came out, there was this guy that I had really heavy feelings for. And, um, and, uh, and there was like some gray area in my life there with this one guy and I don't know. I don't know. I think it kind of goes back to how people fall for who they fall for, you know? And I think there's kind of, it's not very popular to say that like, oh yeah, I fell for a woman. I came out and then, um, I had these confusing feelings for a guy. Um, so it's really not the story that people expect. People like categories. They don't want yeah. so much gray. They do. They do. I would say 99% of my life, though, has been pretty gay. 
And uh, <laughs> so, but that's that's my that's that's the reality of my story. Mm -hmm. um, if we can just go back to school for a little bit, can you tell us a bit? Um, because there are many reasons that you may not have liked school. Um, were there learning challenges that you had that the system didn't know about? Was it more that you just didn't want to be there? Like, were there other places you'd rather be? I mean, all of that. Um, you know, I remember in sixth grade, I got this envelope handed to me. It's funny how things have changed so much that nobody would ever hand an envelope to a kid and be like, give this to your parents. And so it said, you know, to the parents of Tig Notaro, I still have this. And um, and they said, you know, bring that to your parents. I got on the bus and immediately opened the envelope. And I was checked off for all these learning disabilities that they wanted to test me for. And I was like, I'm not showing this to my parents because I thought that, um, uh, you know, learning disabilities and to potentially be placed in special education. And I thought special education meant that I was, you know, mentally challenged, uh, like just a completely different thing where I was like, oh, my gosh, there's no way I'm bringing this home. If my parents don't know or have not noticed this about me, I'm not like, you know what I mean? Like, I was just like, there is no way I so I hid that letter. Nobody followed up ever again. And um, but uh, I'm I never got any confirmation about what maybe my issue was. I, um, I had plenty of insanity, chaos sorts of things going on at home. And that probably was terribly distracting. We moved around a lot. Um, and uh, and I think I wasn't I just wasn't f totally fitting in in a real mainstream way. Um, I also. It's 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 a funny thing because being from the part of the country that I'm from, people love to blame. Oh, well, you you're from Mississippi or you were going to school in Texas or you. And it's like, you know, honestly, the teachers, I remember being really caring and engaged and um, and I can't blame any of the schools or teachers. And I, I don't, I don't believe that was the issue. And I did really struggle with understanding certain things. I mean, I never got past pre-algebra and I, because people will say to me, you're so smart. You must've just been bored. It's like, I didn't understand. You can act like I was just so smart that I was bored. <laughs> I didn't, I do not know how to do pre-algebra. I can't do it. I don't, I, I, I don't know what was going on. There was chaos. There was, um, there was, uh, I'm sure I was bored at times. Who wasn't bored in school? You know, maybe you weren't. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just, I just wanted someone to say like, you did a good job. It's okay. I mean, I got to the point where I said I didn't care. Maybe I did care. I must have cared at some point. But then I reached a point where I was like, I'll be smoking cigarettes and playing my guitar, you know. Um, but uh, but I when I look back, I really. I really remember not understanding a lot of things. And I but I also know I'm not a stupid person. Well, and I think that's that's kind of what I was um what I was just going to say, like the notion, the notion that there are different kinds of intelligence is something that really didn't exist, um, mm -hmm. you know, as part of like the standard vernacular. I mean, I went to public school my whole life. My parents were public school teachers. So there wasn't that notion. It was like, you either got it or you were stupid, you know? And yeah. if you, if you didn't get it, there, there weren't a lot of options. And, you know, a lot of it was, there wasn't a lot of funding. There wasn't a lot of resources in many schools. So like it was, you know, it's kind of the perfect storm. Um, but I think people also often don't like to hear people who are successful, like yourself, say like, no, I really just don't get it. You know, <laughs> like it's a thing. It's true. It's like if I sat down 
and tried to learn these things. Or I used to have moments in my life where I thought, oh, maybe I'll be one of those people that will go back to college or go back to school. I got my GED, but um, my cat ate my GED. And it sounds like a joke, <laughs> but I have what's left of my GED framed in my office. I'm so proud of it because everyone was like, this is going to be so important in your life. You have to, if you're dropping out, you have to get your GED. And my, I left it on the kitchen table. My cat ate it. It, of course, ultimately ended up in a kitty litter box. And then so what's left is truly framed in my office. And I nobody's asked for it. it the only time it comes up is on a podcast or, or, or some sort of interview. Mind Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Noom. When we try and get healthier, a lot of us think of the things that we can't have. Instead of thinking of all the things that we can add to our lives when we start to take control of our health and the way that we eat. And that's where Noom comes in. Noom is a psychology-based approach to help us change our mindset about food and eating for good. Building better habits means a more sustainable journey to better health. And it can feel overwhelming to find ways to feel good. There's so many different equipment and programs and supplements out there. There's no need to try and take on a whole mountain of wellness at once, which was like one of the most important things I learned about Noom when I started Nooming. You don't have to do it all at once. You start where you are and you do it one step at a time. There were many goals that I tackled with Noom. And one of the things was just learning more about nutrition. There were so many things I didn't know about how food was processed. I learned so much just from my first week with them. Start building better habits for healthier long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash breakdown. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash breakdown. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Blinkist. Jonathan, you know that expression? You can't have it all? No, I like it all. <laughs> well, with Blinkist, you can have it all. Blinkist takes top nonfiction books like Emotional Intelligence, that's a good one, and Organized Mind, haven't read that yet. They pull out the key takeaways and they put them in 15 minute text and audio explainers called Blinks with over thousands of titles in 27 categories, plus shorecasts, which are blinks for podcasts. The Blinkist app gives you the knowledge you need in the time you actually have. We're very busy people. You spend a lot of time driving, traveling, being busy. It's true. Blinkist allows you to absorb all of that information in ways that work for your lifestyle, Jonathan. Little bite-sized blinks. I love it. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. What do they do, JC? Go to Blinkist.com slash MBB to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off Blinkist's premium membership. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash MBB and get 25% off and a free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist.com slash MBB. So... If you mention chaos once, I'm willing to let it go. If you mention it twice, I'm going to follow up. Do you talk about some of the chaos that you grew up with? Yeah, I mean, I have. my. Um, in fact, I have a book, if anybody's interested. It's called I'm Just a Person. Um, but uh, I, uh, my parents were divorced. Um, my mother, there was a lot of, um, uh, how do you say, partying. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, I didn't have, my stepfather was very structured and he traveled a lot. He was an attorney, but when he was gone, it was like he left three kids at home, me and my brother and my mother. And there, there wasn't, my mother would stay up till all hours with, you know, friends, neighbors, um, there was just a lot of like, there was a guy that was now my mother, I don't want to sound like I'm naive, but I know for a fact, my mother wasn't doing drugs, but there was this guy that she was, that my parents were friends with that would come in from England and stay with us every year. And he's actually, who turned me on me and my brother onto the really deeply turned us on to like the Beatles and the whole British invasion of rock music. And I was walking around like five and six years old, just deeply into my Beatles vinyl collection. 
and, you know, the Rolling Stones and the Who and all of that. But um, but this guy overdosed. He lived, but overdosed, my brother told me, on heroin in our in our house when he was staying with us. And so th- it just wasn't like you come home and and I don't want to paint the wrong picture. It wasn't like, you know, our our we were fed and our house was clean and we were going to, you know what I mean? Like there was certain things that there was normal structure, but there was also just um a lack of structure and a lot of like chaos. And the partying went from like drinking to uh, a friend coming in town and overdosing on heroin in our no, I um, get it. guest room. <laughs> um, was your dad still in your life? Yeah. My father was very, um, he also passed away. He, he died like, I think a year after my mother died. Um, but he was, he was pretty adrift in, in life. Wasn't holding down jobs. He, very well like he worked as a security guard or like um uh then he would work at a pizza restaurant or you know just kind of job to job type person and um and he he ended up getting sober i think that's where he and my mother kind of connected when they were younger um he was friends with my uncle. So my mother met him through my uncle. And I think they all were kind of free spirited, uh, party people. And then my parents popped out a couple of kids and, and I think that was kind of the end of that. They divorced when I was six months old and, Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, and, but my father was, in and out of my life as a kid, but then, um, not so much in my life as an adult. Um, and then, but then when he was dying, I, I went and, and saw him and said goodbye. And I met, I met a brother of mine. I have, I have other like half siblings and, and so there's also chaos that's come from, that whole world of what my father brought, you know, or didn't bring. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I, it, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine when you're going through all of these things as a kid that as terrible or wrong as these roads feel that you're on, that it's oddly the right road or can become the right road. One of the truly laugh out loud um, sequences that you talk about or that, that, that you live for us in drawn um, involves Jenny Slate. My Jenny Slate connection is that she has taken pretty much every job that I ever auditioned for. So I (laughs) thought it was so incredible that you have this hilarious Jenny Slate um, moment. And, um, I, I, while I don't know the full extent and timeline um, of, you know, kind of a lot of the medical stuff that happened to you, um, I, I have so many similar stories of um, medical anomaly after anomaly. And like, you relate. I completely relate. And what I thought of when I was watching um, the Jenny Slate thing unfold, which is basically like every time she's supposed to have tea with Jenny Slate, she's like, well, I have pneumonia. And Jenny's like, oh, okay, I'll call you back in a couple of days. She's like, no, I'm in the hospital. Like, and like every two days, it's some. It's, it's insane. It, and I wish it was exaggerated. I wish it was exaggerated. And it was all over a four month period of time where I had pneumonia. Then I contracted this intestinal disease that was eating my insides. Then my mother tripped and hit her head and was taken off life support. Then um, my girlfriend and I broke up and then I was diagnosed with invasive cancer. And that was all in four months. I I also do want to talk about, um, you know, there's there's some very, very kind of, you know, I think historic in in the comedy and really industry um, worlds about 
how you, um, you know, introduce basically the public to this concept of um, your experience with cancer and you also did not get reconstructive surgery and you've been, you know, very, you know, kind of vocal and in, you know, a very specific case, visually vocal about it. Um, I actually wanted to ask you about your decision to not have chemotherapy. Um, and I know it's obviously a very personal decision. I'm not asking you to give medical advice. You know, there's a lot, um, there's a lot to this. And, and obviously there's also specificity to everyone's diagnosis as to what kind of is within the bounds of, of recommendation. But um, I, I, I did want to ask if you'd be open to talking about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, the this timeline was very condensed. It, it it was a lot of stuff on my body in a very quick succession, and um, and C diff. You know, I'm I'm very <laughs> I'm famous for having cancer, but what was truly the hardest thing was C. diff. Um, C. diff is, is the intestinal disease that I uh, had that wrecked my insides. And, um, and I was still going through that when I was diagnosed with cancer. And so after I had a double mastectomy, my doctor told me that the, that she really felt like she was able to get all of the cancer out of my body. For me to have chemo, it would be um, just as uh, just as a precaution, just to be extra careful. However, I was so weak from C diff. I could barely, it's like in Drawn, I was talking about how I could barely uh, walk across my loft. Yeah. That was the condition I was in for a very long time between C. diff, uh, because I couldn't keep food and nutrients in my body. And, and then I had this diagnosis and this massive surgery while I was struggling with C. diff. And I can't, what I the only way I can explain to people what C diff is like is is if you have um, food poisoning every day of your life, that kind of like shakes and and sweat like you can't keep food in your system at all. And I had that for months on end, and also diagnosed with invasive cancer double mastectomy. So I opted out of chemo and I've seen people on chemo and uh, I just cannot imagine if in the state that I was in also layering chemo on top of that. It just didn't seem possible. I, I don't think, I, I just, it didn't seem possible. And so I just did hormone treatment um, following the surgery and continued to see my oncologist uh, every three months. And um, in time, because of the issues I've had with my stomach after C. diff, at my intestinal, uh, my digestive uh, system and um my just the different things that have come up through all of my different um health issues i decided to change my diet and have become uh plant based and that's been a huge part of my uh process in feeling better i believe before we let you go, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I am curious. You do have a very rich kind of fantasy life that's part of your comedy, which I really love. Um, but I'm curious, sort of in your in your non-comedy time, in your non-stage time, what are the things that kind of bring you comfort in terms of mental wellness, mental health? Like, are you a meditator? Are you a, do you like running? Like, I don't know. What do you like? What keeps you? If I tried to run with this body, um, <laughs> wouldn't happen. Um, 
I've tried meditating, but uh, I have I have a real interest in it, and I hope I will get to the point where I'm practicing that. But it's really hard in this world, and with all of the distractions and a busy career and a spouse and kids and phones and internet and the news and just all of it. And, um, and I'm constantly trying to scale down and refocus and I'm, you're catching me in, in a, in a whole situation with that right now. Um, but it kind of reminds me of when I lived in a studio apartment, my coworker, we, this was like 25 years ago, we worked at a coffee shop together and she got evicted from her apartment and she moved in with me and she brought this little, this rug. And, and I felt so fancy because I had a rug in my studio apartment. And when she moved out, she said, uh, you can keep that. And I was like, gosh, thank you so much. It was, I mean, it was a rug. And, um, and then I noticed in time, I realized before I had that rug, I used to just sweep and then mop the floor. And now with that rug, I have to sweep and mop the floor. And now I have to clean that rug, <laughs> you know? And it's just that more and more and more and more and getting away from simplicity. And I know, look, I was in a studio apartment with a rug and I felt overwhelmed. If you can imagine how I feel now when I get overwhelmed by all of the things and all of the uh, just stuff. And, um, and so I think where I find comfort is assessing my life and ways that I can pull back and remain f as focused and present as I can be. So that's, that's, that's the only thing I can say to that. And I find it in different ways. And as I said, I'm, I'm in a, a whole thing this week that I happen to be talking to you, um, of a major refocus. We're so grateful that part of your refocus was helping us focus on you. We really, really appreciate your time. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. It was really nice uh, talking to you. And I believe I'm going to be talking to you again soon on my podcast. I'm getting ready. I'll even, I'll, I'll, I'll wear a different shirt. It'll be like <laughs> a new thing. I'll put on lipstick. It'll be a whole thing. <laughs> and if I can mention um, before I go, I mean, that podcast is called Don't Ask Tig that you're going to be on. And I have another podcast with actually Cheryl Hines. Um, and, um, and we, when I say we talk about documentaries every week, it's, we barely talk about a documentary every week. It's a really ridiculous show. It's called uh, Tig and Cheryl True Story. Well, thank you so much. Continue to take care. And again, thank you for being part, part of your uh, refocusing. We were glad to be part of it. Thanks so much. That was really awesome. I mean, I'm always curious what like, comedians are like when they're not on stage. Like, I'm just always curious. and When they're in real life. Yeah, like she's very different from a lot of comedians. Like, you know, when you see comedians do interviews, they're like very like, oh, hey, you know, like they're always, she's very, yeah, she yeah. seems very like, also when she describes her childhood, I mean, she obviously describes, you know, some of the chaos and, and obviously there's a lot of, you know, a, a lot of interesting things there, but also like kind of just sounds like she kind of bopped along in life and then, I mean, I wanted to ask how she got into comedy and like all the things, but um, just really, um, you know, I like when someone doesn't have a story that's like, I didn't graduate from high school, but everything's amazing. And like, you know what I mean? Like, it sounds like it was hard. And I was going to ask more yeah. about like how that school situation, because it marks you. you, you can't not mark you. And I have a lot that I say about the school system and feeling that it fails so many people, especially who... Like, even if you can't understand math, it doesn't mean you should fail out of school. It should, means you should be refocused on areas that you do. Right. Have. Or if you can't get math in that particular way, and if you really need it, then I think there should be a lot more options. But more of what I'm getting at is the notion that, like, 
when you have an institution like that, that is the right way right. in so many people's minds to achieve a life that you want. And if that doesn't work for you and it closes for you, it's so hard not to be like, it's me, not the system. Sure. And then how do you, you know, I carried a lot of that with me when things you were... You still do. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Did we think we're over that? <laughs> oh, he can say it. <laughs> you know, to speak to your point, I think it, it would be really scary, you know, to not finish school and... You know, it sounds like she had people really encouraging her to get her GED, which, you know, I do think, you know, in some sense, like it, it does, it helps give you a little bit of closure, you know, from that part of your life. But um, yeah, I, I have a, a close friend who didn't graduate high school and it was really like a, a chip on their shoulder, you know, yeah. really into adulthood and into success. And, you know, as an, as an artist, you know, like it's still you, um, yeah, it's a very large societal structure for you to feel like you can't, you know, fit into. And and it feels like wrong to compare it. But let's not compare. Let's look for the similarities, not the differences. Like, I really wanted to go to medical school. That was my plan. Like doctor and medical school? What other kind of medical school is there? I mean, you're like a doctor. I'm a PhD, though. So yeah, I wanted you wanted to go to, an MD. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to go to medical school. Right. I wanted to go to medical school. I went yeah. to grad school. And... You know, there there came a point, and again, it's it's different, but it's the same message of like, oh, the way those people's brains work. I was so sick and tired of people saying like, you have to study harder, like you can do it, just like you know, get the get a tutor, and like, no, it's also okay for us to say like, as people, we're different. There are certain things that like my brain's not gonna do the same way. Um, obviously for young people, I have a very strong interest, you know, before people get to college or grad school or med school, um, to have people feel supported. And, um, anyway, that was Speaking it. of feeling supported, I got another Tell tie me. in there. Let's do an Ask My Am Anything. Okay. Ask My Am Anything. Yeah. Danielle D asks, do we ever truly lose the trauma response that's left after abuse or is it just dormant? Oh my. It's a tough one. Um, Danielle, thanks for the question. The, the simple answer is, I mean, and I'm literally speaking as a neuroscientist, like nothing gets, I don't mean this like sounds pretentious, like nothing gets lost. I mean, but it sounds like lost in the sense is a good thing. No, 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 that, that, that's what I'm saying. Like the, the mark of your experience lives in your brain. It lives in your body. You could say it lives in your soul. Like, I don't want to get deep, but speaking sp strictly from like a neuroscience perspective. Yeah, that's, that, that has happened to you what, and I think there's something in between, does it get lost and does it lay dormant? And what that is, is that you gain coping mechanisms and you gain skills and you gain perspective, which is kind of like this amorphous term. But what perspective really is, is a set of coping mechanisms that allow you to place your trauma in its true place. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who have, who experience flashbacks or who have blackouts or things like that related to memory, you're often reminded to like, is this happening now? And it sounds like such a ridiculous thing because like you think like, oh, this is it. For, for people who have a very strong trauma response, you can feel like you are in another place. That's actually the definition of flashback um, is not that you're remembering something, is that your physiological state is in a different you know, time. So part of that perspective is, is learning to be able to, to reorient and it does, it takes a certain amount of skills to be able to say like, oh, these are the tools, like, oh, these are trigger signs, these are warnings. If I watch that movie, this is gonna happen. And so like avoiding things that you know are gonna be triggering. Um, so yeah, I also don't want people to think like, oh, if I have trauma, it's gonna like live with me forever. I'm never gonna quote, get over it. You absolutely can thrive, you know, beyond just surviving, you can thrive um, if you've had trauma. But yeah, it absolutely does take learning skills that typically do come from, you know, either a, a professional or many resources. Um, yeah, I think, is that, 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 that like... I think that's a good answer. Okay. Also, I think not to open up a totally other uh, topic area because, uh, you know, these things are not related universally, but like in some ways when you have a trauma response like that, time is nonlinear. Yeah. And, and Well, people will be like, oh, with time, it'll get better. Not necessarily. No, but I've had that experience too, right. where I've like lost it at something that's seemingly fairly non-threatening. 
no. <laughs> That's not where I was going. Not relationship counseling currently. Uh, but in where it's something that objectively there isn't a huge risk, but I have a really strong reaction to it. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. That is something that's, all right, you're being really serious. No, so no. What I'm saying is like, yes. And the fact is, no, I'm, I'm agreeing because I've witnessed this. Um, no, I, I think that's an important point, though, that the notion's not, well, that happened 40 years ago. What's yeah. wrong with you? Yeah. Or, oh, you're very young. Uh, that happened 35 years ago. What's wrong with you? Or that happened 20 years ago or five years ago. Yeah. Or We're marked by our experiences, yes. but it doesn't Correct. mean you still can't thrive. If you want to ask Maya anything, you can do so at bialikbreakdown.com. That's B-I-A. L-I-K. Breakdown. Dot com. Or you can just date me and then you can ask me things anytime you want. She doesn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't answer unless you type it into the little form. <laughs> if you have I mean that's that's a treasure trove. <laughs> what are the questions Jonathan is submitting to ask <laughs> him anything that she's not answering? Given that I often scan to see which ones we have, I haven't picked myself. What does that say about me? <laughs> what if happens you haven't now? checked out the Instagram page. Check out the Instagram page. At the Alec Breakdown. Now are we done? I think so. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction was And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown.